Welcome to the second interview for the Science Behind the Magic series that I run on this channel, and I am incredibly excited to have Karen Lord here with me today. If you are not new to my channel, you know I've been loving her works for years now, and she was near the top of the list of people I wanted to ask once I had this series idea in the back of my mind. And it's quite apt because there actually is a Karen Lord, Ken Lu conversation on YouTube you can watch. Um, and Ken Lu was the first person that I had on this series. And today we're going to specifically talk about the Cygnus books, which she has behind her with the best of all possible worlds, the galaxy game and the blue beautiful world, which are part of the Cygnus um, beta verse, a wonderful sci-fi. I don't know if it's a trilogy or an ongoing series. Maybe I'll get an answer to that later, but it's a wonderful <laughs> universe to explore. And also a book that I always recommend to everyone, not a part of this world, but is Redemption in Indigo. This is the first book I read and what made me go into your entire catalog of works. It is a wonderful, fantastical story. But I'm going to now give the floor to Karen to tell us about her background, what made her want to be an author, and what she, why she chooses to write the wonderful works that she does. So take it away. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. If I was in your top list of people to interview, um, you were in my top of my list of people to be interviewed by because I did come across your channel and I was like, wow, you know, the, how, how to put it. It's always nice when a reader understand, um, enjoys your work, but, but there's a special additional something when a reader understands your work. And when I saw how you were engaging with my stories and also how you were engaging with other Caribbean literature. I was like, oh, this is, this is actually someone I could have a lot of fun um, talking to in an interview because you, you seem to have a, a background and a sensibility that, that picks up a lot on the things we're doing. Um, I always say to people, you know, you ask me to give a bit of background and sometimes the first thing I have to say to people is, I'm a foreigner. And what does that mean? <laughs> that means that um, quite a lot of Readers are very accustomed to reading um, works from American or Canadian or um, British authors. And I think that there's a way in which they, they don't understand that they are um, looking at certain kind of cultural norms and accepting them as, oh, this is the way literature should look like. Um, I come from the Caribbean. I live in the Caribbean. I'm in Barbados right now. And we, yeah. So we came out of a colonial heritage, British Empire, da, 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 da. well, some of us anyway. But there's still a very, <laughs> there's still a very um, strong set of influences um, from various places. Of course, there's the, the African influence from enslaved people being brought over. There's indigenous influence from people who um, were um, there at the start of colonialism. Um, there's also various waves of immigration that came in via India, um, um, from India, from China. Um, and, you know, we, we do have what I would call a very rich pot of, of things to draw from. And not just in terms of content, but also in terms of forms of storytelling. So um, you asked me um, how did I decide to become an author? <laughs> you start by being a reader, I think. You start by being just like a completely enthralled of story. And the, the first book of mine that you read um, was indeed my debut novel. And I think, you know, when I was in school, I was like, oh, you know, I like to be a writer, but I wasn't satisfied of what I was writing. I felt, you know, this, this, this is the writings of somebody who hasn't lived a lot yet. <laughs> so let me go and just like live a little soul, have something to write about. And maybe by the time I started looking at Redemption in Indigo, um, that would have been around, I would say about 2003 or so, I was drafting that. Um, that was a while back. That would have been a couple of years after I came back from Caracas, actually, um, where I was posted as a diplomat. Um, and I started it almost like, a, almost like an exercise because I had started to um, do some studies at the university here in um, socioeconomic studies um, and you begin to write longer and longer form things. And I said, you know, I need to keep in practice of this because at a certain point I had to like pause my studies here and I was looking to go to Wales instead to restart my PhD. And um, I said, I want to actually try writing a novel this time. I'm actually going to do it because it's all about being able to hold the longer form in your head. Um, so I always say to people, I didn't start off with short stories. I, I really did much more to start off with like, you know, that's just dive into the novel. And um, when I was thinking, well, what do I write about? Um, I went back to a folk tale from uh, Collier's Junior 
encyclopedias. Um, they had folks from around the world, and there was this one from West Africa, and it was called Ansike Karamba the Glutton. And I loved this when I was growing up because I was like, you know, all of these folk tales about, you know, princesses and princes and, you know, they get married, live happily ever after. But here is one about a woman getting rid of a bad husband. And that speaks to me on a certain level. <laughs> Not that I've ever been married or anything like that. But just the idea that, you know, although the title was in his name, I felt very much that the heroine was the wife who just like finally got rid of him. And, um, and that was how Redemption in Indigo was born, because it was all about giving her a longer, um, a longer arc, a larger stage, and seeing what else could happen. Um, so the, just, just three chapters in her, the folk tale, and the rest is just me kind of spinning off <laughs> into wherever. Um, and then, um, I, you know, I've mentioned little bits and pieces of my background, just a really quick arc. I did start off with a, an undergrad in history of science and technology, uh, major in physics and a minor in astronomy. I was, I think, half a course short of an English minor, but we won't mention that. <laughs> and, um, and then I went through, um, you know, after working for a while, I did a master's in science technology policy. I did the Oxford Foreign Service program some years after that. Um, then I did my PhD and film PhD, which were basically in religious studies. But I always say to people, there were a lot of statistics <laughs> in my PhD. Because I was looking, um, I was doing a, um, questionnaires and looking at, at people's religiosity. So we were looking at a lot of um, um, kind of like number crunching. So when people are like, oh, you did religious studies, so you know Hebrew, I'm like, oh man, so much the opposite. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I just sort of say more sociology because it's more descriptive of what I do. And then that feeds into my fiction because especially by the time I was looking at the best of all possible worlds, um, the best of all possible worlds, by the way, way was and i hope this i think this might have come through it was totally my happy place yeah. because i was struggling with the sequel to redemption i was like trying to do things and i don't know what well, what happened was redemption and indigo hadn't actually been published yet but it had won a major award um at home oh. and um and i was suffering from i can't quite call it imposter syndrome because i was happy to win the award and i thought it was a good book but i felt like I had to prove that I wasn't a one hit wonder. I had to prove that it wasn't just like a, you know, some sort of mistake. So I said, okay, I'm gonna start writing a sequel to this right away, even as I try to get it published and so on and so forth. And I was trying too hard. I was, I was, I was a lot of my depth. I was trying things I didn't yet have the craft for. Um, I was trying things that I, you know, I could see where all the flaws were and it was very frustrating. So I said, okay, I need, I need to give myself some writing exercises. So the best of all possible worlds is my writing exercises. <laughs> Whenever there was something that wasn't working out properly in what the book, the manuscript that became unraveling, I would test it out with a chapter of the best of all possible worlds. So to give you an example, um, you know, the, the one, the chapter Fallen, where um, Delarua is completely your utterly unreliable narrator because she's she's literally suffered a kind of a brain injury and and she keeps like repeating time over and over again um and, and her memories are, are just like not forming properly and um and that was actually the result of something i was trying to do in unraveling and struggling and couldn't get figured out so i said okay i need to to work with this fluidity of time and and the unreliable narrator that's still trying their best to be reliable um within this chapter and let me tell you that that chapter went through some revisions that was not an easy chapter but it's it's one of my favorites now it's it really is it's it's just um and and Delarue is a very she's a very helpful protagonist i have to say to people please do not think i'm anything like her <laughs> i'm not she, she's not I a self-insert <laughs> she's not a self-insert i'm quite capable of writing characters who um, confuse me, surprise me, annoy me at times. Um, but um, Delarue was lovely to write because, above all, she has a kind of a very positive energy and a very, you know, a sense of very much going forward. And um, and she's she's just not typical, you know. She's just not typical. She will say and do things that surprise even the author. And um, so that that was um, that was just like a pleasure to write. And then at the end of all these writing exercises, I was not much farther along with unraveling, and I had a a book's worth of writing exercise. I was like, yeah, no, this can't go to waste. <laughs> so I, I did a, a 
full regrounding, rewrite to not just make it these separate things, but to make an overall arch arc and overall story to it. That was when I created the Cygnus Beta Universe. And because I was still relatively fresh from my PhD and very much into my socioeconomic research that I was doing post PhD, um, I found myself infusing it with a lot of um, some of the things that I'd read. And there's also, I don't even know if you noticed it, but there's a little homage to the Commonwealth in there because um, when they, one of their first trips where they start off in the place is the forest, um, that's actually a homage to Guyana. Um, the bit with Carnival is, is homage to Trinidad. Um, and then there are places that I've only visited briefly um, or haven't seen this precise bit, but, but um, you know, the, the bit with the fairies is really um, a nod to, to New Zealand, the bit with the opera is a nod to Australia. So I was kind of saying hi to the Commonwealth as I, as I sort of journeyed through um, the place. And, um, and, and I, I just had thoughts about the, the planets, operas and so on, but I, I kind of kept it focused on Cygnus Beta just to, to give myself a sense of grounding initially. And, um, and, but while I was writing it, while I was thinking of the universe, all these other ideas were coming to me in terms of, well, you know, if you're going to have such a huge power vacuum, what happens next? And that's, of course, going to be the galaxy game. And then later on, when I was actually writing the galaxy game, I was like, oh, man, I have too many thoughts. This is a far larger book than I want to write right now. So I pushed some of those ideas forward, and that became The Blue Beautiful World. So it's kind of funny when you said to me, is this a trilogy? For two reasons. I always think of a trilogy, a trilogy as one story that's more or less cut up into three bits. And you can't really call um, this particular series that sort of format. It's, it's very much, a, you know, because um, I have a busy life. <laughs> I assume that my readers do too. Um, I long for the days when I was in school or university when you had all these long summer holidays and you could sit down with these door stoppers and these long trilogies and series and the rest of it and just like indulge yourself. I just don't have that time anymore. Um, so even the best of all possible worlds, I like it because I always say to people, take this. You can set it down after a chapter and feel satisfied and then come back to it. You, you don't have to feel like I got to finish the, the book and the book, the entire book has to be read. Uh, and that's largely a, a factor of my just being a busy person and being surrounded by busy friends and, and almost like catering to, to us, to, to our generation. Um, but um, <laughs> you're laughing so much already, I'm worried. Um, no, no, it's, when... just, it's, fun. it's so funny. So I want to hop in real quick and introduce the Cygnus verse to anyone who maybe hasn't seen any of my reviews or hasn't seen it. But it's funny because you say, well, you don't have to keep reading the best of all possible worlds after each chapter. And it's like, no, I have to keep reading the best of all possible worlds <laughs> until it's done. <laughs> I've read it twice. And both times it was like my weekend happy place. It's, you know, it's like, oh, that's it's lovely. episodic like you were talking mm -hmm. about because and it's it's fascinating to hear how it became so episodic you know i never you know knew how it became that way but it's very obviously this long journey story and each journey is a, a different tiny subgenre of something but it's still found family mm -hmm. it's still a team getting to know mm -hmm. each other and dealing with different cult it's so fun and it's like a tv show where it's like sure this is all episodic i need to know what's going to happen with our two main characters because you know it has that <laughs> thread of them going through it all like Mm -hmm. I don't know. I I love it. But the Cygnus Beta verse, it starts on the planet Cygnus Beta, which has people that are associated with people. We we are on Earth Terrans, but it also has people of different backgrounds, different psi abilities, and it has its own government system, its own society. And while you're traveling this planet, you kind of get hints and tidbits of this grander universe and all these different powers. And it is the galaxy game and the blue, beautiful world that really open it up like there is an exposition like not a dump, but there's a character learning about this whole universe. And I'm like, oh, I misunderstood a lot of things until this character had this dossier that he's reading right now. <laughs> so there's this whole universe with many humanoid individuals and it has its mm -hmm. own politics. And it's it has a lot of the tropes and the buzzwords that a lot of people who love space opera will like. I mean, in terms of different methods of travel, you know, playing with time, different technology, there's a whole society that doesn't work with texting it's just all auditory interpretation yes it was very hard for me to understand <laughs> but i was just like i was i was like an oral an, a, a culture with an oral tradition <laughs> gets to a certain level what does that look like you know where it's like yeah we know to write but that's not important what's important is that our brain is not optimized for like listening i also couldn't things. figure so out like, like wow. they're optimized to listen to like four things at once and i was like oh mm -hmm, i cannot mm -hmm. i cannot but so 
is a lot of familiar sci-fi, but in a very unfamiliar cultural landscape. And I think mm -hmm. your your background in science and society really does something very unique here. And the fact that you do pick and choose what details to let us see, because you want it to not overstay its welcome. You don't want it to be this door stopper, like you said. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting needle to weave because I'll be reading a chapter at the beginning of the Galaxy game and I'm like, okay, I don't have enough context to understand this. When will I understand this? And then at the end, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> now I understand this moment. <laughs> There's a lot of trust that I go into some of these later works with. I'm just like, oh, and I appreciate your trust. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I understand that a reader has to be able to trust me when they go in, um, because um, I know exactly where all the pieces are, but I don't always put all the pieces into the book, nor do I always put them at the forefront. I think that because a lot of SF readers, we're kind of we're kind of geeks at heart, and and we love the turning nuts and bolts. We love we love the turning cogs. We love we love the machinery. But um, in my books, the machinery are the people. So I am going to give you what you need in terms of this is how this affects the person. But I mean, do you know how your TV works? Do you? Do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to pretend that I know. I, although I have a physics background, sometimes, you know, you have to pick and choose what parts of the magic you want to understand. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that's that's my approach to it. It's sort of like, you know, I've given you, you know, by the end of the Galaxy game, um, Rafi is sort of strapped into this thing which somehow traverses the dimensions. And I don't go into huge detail about it, you know. And I don't go into huge detail about it because I am not in the business of telling you how a TV works. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to describe the internal combustion engine. I'm not. These are all things that we live with and we are happy to like not know the details of. And um, for me, sometimes I need to know the details, as I said, in my background notes, but I don't necessarily need to give them to you, the reader. Um, you also asked, uh, you said you can't visualize the wall running. So No, yeah, the wall, uh, to be fair, I'm not a very visual reader, but I have tried mm -hmm. over and over again to try, like, is it like pinball? Like, I'm just trying to see this wall running <laughs> game in my head. <laughs> I've, I've described it before as a, a sort of a combination between, um, you know, like American football, where you're kind of almost like running up and down a field, but then also um, like um, rock climbing or cliff diving, because the whole point is that the actual, um, where the gravity is, is always shifting. So, you know, the, the team has to adapt to what kind of movement technique am I going to use? And also I have to get the whole team together. We have to move as one body because when the, the mass of one team um, kind of moves forward, they actually begin to get the gravity in their favor and put the other team at a disadvantage. But why I'm laughing so hard is that um, the concept of wall running is kind of based on cricket. <laughs> and there's so many people who don't understand cricket. That that's like, very true. Gonna, I, it's like, that's I'm not a sport that I have this. a strong... <laughs> I'm going to explain this, but not too much because cricket is something that has like layers of understanding. Like, you know, I, I can say to you, you know, what, what it means when you have an over and wickets and, and runs and whatever. But I don't really remember where Silly Midoff is on the field. I don't really remember. I, I know where the slips are, you know, because that's, that's actually a bit easy thing. But, you know, there are commentators, really commentators who will be able to say exactly where the fielders are standing with all the particular field positions. And they have it such a precision that if you are like really steeped in the lore of cricket, you'll be able to listen to this. Here's shades of um, Padartum again. Listen to this and picture exactly how the field is out just from a radio program. But then there are the whole like mass of us, which are just sort of like, yeah, we won. <laughs> That's all we really care about. <laughs> so, um, what, so yeah, there, there are things that people have read and said, oh, this is confusing and this isn't explained, whatever. I'm like, yeah. And? <laughs> what, I, what I did like about wall running, though, even though, like, it, I think the reason why I wanted to know what it looked like is because it sounded so cool. And it's like, oh, I'm really, my imagination is not, it's not up to the task. But at the end of the day, what I needed to know about wall running mm is well, like our own society, sports are always intertwined with politics and where things are. It, it's it's inseparable mm -hmm. from the workings of economies and politics and that really comes through, but also our history and the way that wall running gets connected to the history of the universe, I was not expecting. I thought it was very fun and it's not something that a lot of books really focus on. And like you also do that in the Blue Beautiful World where you're like, well, a pop artist is very important. And it's also a way of bringing together the glue of things. So like, you look at parts of society that I don't think we give relevant weight to, I think. 
And I, I enjoy that because I, I think it's fun and I think it's it's relevant. Like what do people always talk about every day? Like right now, Beyonce and Taylor Swift are like the biggest mega stars in the world right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so I have a, a bit of a, a reveal for you. It's not a huge reveal because I've started talking about it more. Um, and, and I do want to say it's not that sometimes when you're writing things, you're almost not conscious of the extent to which um, your, your work and your research influences you. But I do have to say at this point that my PhD specifically looked at um, religion and non-religious settings. And what I did was I studied um, the sports science and music departments of um, a university. Like gave students a modified questionnaire that they would ordinarily give to say people who belong to a church or religion to find out whether they felt the same way and acted the same way within their communities towards their sport, towards their music, as someone would towards a religion and within their congregation. And there were strong correlations throughout because that element of community, transcendence and identity, those are three things I was looking at, are as strong in music and in sports as they are in religion. And that in a way is what has ended up, yeah, my, my PhD is scattered through these three books and it's really embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's more fun to read than a dissertation. So I'm here for it. Like, personally, someone who wrote my Definitely dissertation more a year and a half ago. I wrote. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, so Cygnus Beta, it sounds like that's the planet that came first. Um, and you, mm -hmm. you talked a little bit about how you were visiting different parts of the Commonwealth in it. Was in your exercise of writing the best of all possible worlds, what was, what was your first glimpse of Cygnus Beta? Like, what was that first moment of like, oh, this is a new planet I'm visiting and I'm writing about? So the first glimpse really was chapter one, not the intro where um, we come with Klinak and, and um, Neraldi and they're just learning about the disaster. But our very first glimpse of Grace as, as unreliable and reliable na narrator. And um, that whole idea of being in a place and seeing people who have been just like um, completely disoriented, completely um, ejected from their place of comfort coming into this new space and um, and just almost like not knowing what to do. So I would say that that image of almost like a, a sort of a dock site or, or a boundary being crossed from um, what was known into what is now completely unknown was my first kind of um, image of Cygnus Beta. And why um, Delarue was an interesting person to be as it were the, the host and guide for, for um, Cygnus Beta is that um, she combines both a familiarity with the planet and also um, deep misconceptions about her planet. <laughs> um, because we all have um, a sort of a rosy view of, of what our countries are and where we live. And um, even, even when we're being critical, we always think, oh, well, we're still better than X, Y, Z, and in many ways we just aren't. <laughs> and um, so the, the journey of discovery isn't just for the Sidiri, it's also for her. These are still places that she, in many cases she's never visited. These are, are pockets of, of um, you know, different types of cultures that she's never encountered. And it's, it's very much still a learning curve for her. Um, but yes, um, really the first image was, you know, um, so, some of you were sneeringly referred to it as, oh, bureaucrats in love. Yes, bureaucracy. It is Grace, government official, welcoming refugees. That is the image that I first had of Sigas Beta. I mean, that's one of... There's a lot that is cozy to me about the best of all possible worlds, even though it's not a, I don't want anyone to think that there's only light moments in it. There are actually quite a lot of heavy moments that characters go through. I mean, it starts from a place of loss of home and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do love that it imagines a place where the instinct of Cygnus Beta was not to push away these people that needed a place. It was to figure out how to ethically and caringly combine cultures. Like the questions Grace was always asking was, okay, what do you guys want? What are your goals? Do you want to become a part of this blend? Do you want to keep your traditions? Because there are steps we can take for all of these options or a blending of, and like, I mean, and I live in the United States. That's not how we do things here. And so it was nice <laughs> to see an imagination of that. Maybe there are places in the world that I don't know their government systems, but it was, it was nice to me, especially as someone who like, I have family in Venezuela that I never get to see here because of the visa laws and everything like that. And it's just mm -hmm. like, I had to get married on another continent to have some of my family there just because of rules of a government, yeah. because they're so scared yes. of other. 
<laughs> and yes. this is a planet yes. that thrives on otherness. It thrives on individuality. Yes. But as you said, we learn through grace. It's not a perfect government. It's just mm -hmm. trying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's trying. And I also... I liked the emphasis on homesteading, which isn't a thing that I think about a lot. I enjoyed the differences between the urban culture and the homesteading mm -hmm. and how we saw all of that. Basically, of all your planets, Cygnus Beta is the one that I would want to be on the most. Is it, it, That one's my favorite. It's also the one I've seen the most, obviously. Um, and the next planet mm -hmm. we see is um, Punartum. Is that how you say it? Or do you pronounce right. Hazel? Yeah. That planet, though is the most interesting to think about because of some of the stuff we've already mentioned. So why was that the next planet you decided we were going to jump onto in this universe? So why Punartum? So um, Punartum is an interesting midpoint into the galaxy because it's not one of the, the first four. It's, it's still a colonial planet. So you're still going to get that sense of, um, you know, we are we have our own identity in some ways, but we still um, have some very deep origins. And we are a little more, I don't quite want to say welcoming, but there's a, there's a concept. The, the, the idea that I was having is that probably Sidira and Shune were the most kind of difficult planets to live on because people there have been so long established in their culture and so kind of, I don't quite want to say smug, but there is a, a sort of a smugness of empire. There is a kind of, we've been doing this for so long and our traditions are ironclad and you will fit in. Um, but when you come to a colony that has a bit more of a mix or a place that's just faded, which is purposely patchwork, you do have um, sort of an understanding that, oh, we're gonna have people coming in who are working with us and studying with us and so forth, who are not going to be expected to just like do the cookie cutter, whatever. But at the same time, Punartum does have a lot of pride because, as you can see, they have some very strong traditions still. They have, you know, spun off on their own as well. They want to seize ball running as well. You know, we're going to make this ours. <laughs> but they also want to make a political statement with it because there's that rivalry going on. So um, I, I get to play with different aspects of, of um, you could say, what, what it looks like when a, a kind of a, uh, an old established colony starts approaching being like an empire itself. So like in a way, maybe it's almost America, who knows? <laughs> like um, without, without the, um, you know, the kind of you know, stealing from indigenous peoples of land thing, but I digress. <laughs> so um, Punartum was a little different in the sense that you stay pretty much in one city. Cygnus Beta, I take you all the city, we, we ramble all the way through um, small towns, homesteadings, whatever, whatever, villages, and there's huge variety. And that was important to me because too many SF stories have um, planets like a, a monoculture, and I absolutely abhor the monoculture. So I wanted to show one planet that had just a lot of stuff going on. But Punartum, we stay in one city, and it's the main city, and it's where I get to play a little bit with the concept of the academe or academia, really. Yeah. And um, and there it's all about, well, you know, we are, and, and mind you, Punartum has achieved that prominence precisely because Anshuni as a planet has gone through some serious stuff because, and it's not a spoiler to say this, I should say it now, but basically they're, they've gone through an extreme ice age. So they are almost like in hunkered down survival mode, mostly underground. And a lot of the stuff that's really happening is indeed happening on Punartum. So, um, Punartum gives us enough of what's happening on Anshuni as well, in the sense of if we did not have that Ice Age on Anshuni, where would they be going forward to? Punartum is almost like the way they continue to keep progressing, continues the traditions of their kind of, you know, home planet, mother planet, but definitely adds their own spice. Bringing Rafi into it, um, I just, I absolutely love that because, okay, so I am... Um, I understand the story, the allure of the story where you have uh, a team who's like got these special powers and he's just like, you know, got a mission and he's high part and whatever, whatever. But the reality, it comes down to not only suspension of disbelief for the reader, but suspension of disbelief for the writer. And for some reason, by the time I got to writing books, there were just certain things that although they were comforting to me to read when I was younger. I no longer believed enough in them when I was older to make a convincing story out of them. So when you see Rafi, Rafi does not, 
he's, he's a little clueless. He doesn't have it all together. He has that talent. He still needs to be trained. He still needs to be mentored. He still needs direction. And a lot of the time, he's just like, what the France is going on? <laughs> and he's letting people guide him. And that's where Ntenman became so important as well, because Ntenman is, is, is more focused, understands the background, and can be his host in Punartum, but also, you know, still very much has his own agenda because, you know, he's, he's trying to do various things for his own status. Um, and, but, but Rafi allows us to see someone who is, you know, to almost use your metaphor before, he's kind of pinballing his way through Punartum and then later on, Shlene, he's, he's letting forces kind of direct him. He's letting other people make decisions for him a bit. And it's not because he's, he's weak or he's, you know, he's untalented or anything like that. It's because he's, he's a young teenager and he doesn't have all the answers. He doesn't know everything. He's, he's still figuring out not, not, not just the world he lives in, but the galaxy he lives in. He's trying to figure out if it's a society that tolerates who he is as an individual. And um, all of these things are quite enough to deal with without, um, you know, kind of saving the world the first time around or even saving the galaxy the first time around. Um, someone who is reading The Blue Beautiful World right now is, um, is having fun, like, popping into um, Discord and sending messages saying, look at this, you know. So it's nice to see people freak out in real time. But one of the things that kind of hit was when, um, and I'm sorry, this is going to be spoilerific, but I haven't been able to avoid it in any previous interview, so what a hate. So we see Rafi in the, in the Blue Beautiful World under another name. And by then, by the time you're, like, say, by the end of the book, Rafi's basically in his early 50s. So you have the whole arc from he's a child in the best of all possible worlds, like, you know, just about, just about reached his teen years. Galaxy Game is, is where you see like um, sort of the midpoint of his teen years going into older teen. And then Blue Beautiful World has him, you know, some, some, some time in his 40s and some of the time in his, oh, sorry, the first part of the Galaxy Game, the beginning and the end of the Galaxy Game, you actually show Rafi as patron and yep. he is a patron and he is um, probably in his late 30s around then. And um, so you, you actually get this arc of a life and the clueless boy in the first two books becomes a very competent man. And that's, that's it. That's, that's, the, that's the sort of thing I can believe in and, and write a story about. Um, where, you know, he's been fortunate in his mentors. He's been fortunate in the people who care about him and love him and ground him and support him. And he's able to get to the point where he's a full adult and can make good decisions. This was totally a segue. You started off by Y Punartum and I just like ended up talking Well, I mean, I think Y Punartum <laughs> is partially if you, I mean, I guess I don't know if Punartum came first or focusing on Rafi, but like it does seem to be a great place for Rafi to explore his younger, young adult teenage years, especially mm -hmm. because it's very clear at the beginning of Galaxy Game and Signa Beta that this government is really not equipped for Rafi's specific brand of power. They're used yeah. to certain things and even his family is like, oh, we don't know if we can protect you and make sure that you aren't taken advantage of here. So mm -hmm. even though maybe something seemed to happen like in a blink of an eye and it feels very fast, it makes sense for him to end up on this other planet, which, you know, has its own systems, its own rules, its own agendas and corruption. But at least Rafi himself can maybe mm -hmm. learn and breathe and explore and things like that. So yeah. I, I not, think it I'm makes not sense. risk being locked up. <laughs> yes. Well, mm -hmm. that was so terrifying at the beginning of that thing, especially because of that school we start in, which is not your traditional, you know, magic school or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the traditional magic school, oh goodness, that, that's like another podcast. But, yeah. um, <laughs> but basically, again, the idea that you would have um, children with powers and there would not be equal parts, you know, of fear and manipulation. And, you know, I think Ntenman said basically, can we use you? as being one of the options <laughs> that they looked at when they screened these students. And, you know, to go to like real life, contemporary life, there's an extent to which our schools are kind of like propaganda shaping indoctrination machines as well. They're trying to get us to become kind of useful, productive members of society, or at least not be a burden. And um, so there's a little bit of that playing with. And then and Celia and the teacher, you know, I, I wanted to show someone who basically was well-meaning, but just totally enmeshed in the system. 
yeah. you know, and still like being on a certain level abusive but not without realizing that he was being abusive because he's using the tools of the system and the tools of the system are not great. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing I want to talk about with Panartam, though, is how did you or what inspired your social credit system? Because a, a government oh or like, you know, a society's economic and trade is still based on some material quantities and some money. But really, it mattered literally like if you hate networking, this planet is the worst place for you, which we have a character that does hate networking. And he <laughs> they're just trying. <laughs> they're just trying to get by this lieutenant who knows Rafi. But, you know, it's mm -hmm. so societally interconnected and it has so many intricate little rules so what inspired it and how many rules did you write for yourself to make sure you were <laughs> self-consistent so oh goodness i'm just i'm just having a hilarious moment of memory but we'll get we'll get there so um what this is based on again in real life and contemporary life we do have cultures that vary in terms of how important societal rules are there are places that you go to where you, you have to be introduced first to be able to participate in certain social circles where um, you have to be able to, whether it is know when to buy someone a meal or when to go drinking with someone or whatever, all these little subtle um, kind of um, cues and so forth that no one would say that they're codified. They would just be like, oh, this is good behavior or this is what we do and whatever. But the moment you're a foreigner in that space and it becomes a case of you're stopping at the doorway thinking, do I take off my shoes? Do I leave my shoes on? Um, and you realize that, especially if you've traveled a lot, the answer is not the same for every place you go to. So I'm taking that and I'm kind of like um, putting it almost in a formal way. Now, the, the, the cool thing about the social credit is, is um, both how much joy and how much trouble it gave me. The joy was that, um, so I did this thing where I basically said, okay, first of all, there's a story by Isaac Asimov called Strike Breaker. And it's about, um, this planet where um, all like the sewage systems, the waste and whatever, are basically handled by machines, but they still need one person to flip the switch on the machine. And that person, this whole family is like completely, you know, shunned and ostracized. So um, he starts to strike because he wants like better conditions for himself and his family. When I say conditions, they're, they're not in squalor or that, but it's, it's the isolation that's, that's so, you know, and, and the fact that he has to pass that job down to his descendants. And they basically, um, ask someone to come in from off planet to negotiate, to break the strike, to have him flip the switch. And then of course he becomes ostracized and is quietly shipped off planet as quickly as possible. And, uh, and you know, the, the original person is, is still there, still in that position, still unable to get out of that um, kind of particular stigma that they forced him into. And I've always said, I want a world where um, the garbage collectors have it great. And that's Panartum. Because the social credit isn't just about networking, it's also about how crucial you are to the running of the society. And um, the garbage collectors are pretty darn important, let me tell you. So you have um, a situation where, you know, they may be well financially compensated, but they're also given the opposite of stigma. They're given a, a high amount of social credit. So it's like, oh, wow, you know, you, you help keep our, our, our planet clean. That's fantastic. You know, I want to hang out with you because you, you've got social credit. And um, so that, that was like the one thing I was sort of flipping on its head a bit. The other thing is, um, and this was at the time I was doing some, some socioeconomic research with a colleague at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies at University of West Indies. So um, I was chatting with my, my, my colleague and I said, oh, you know, I'm writing this idea of like two layers of credit into this um, future world. And he listened to me talk about it. He said, we're doing a poverty study, which is basically what you're talking about because your access to certain things. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've already heard the term, for example, like food deserts um, and so forth. So you have a situation where you can't just look at the income a person gets. It's also their access to the things that that income is supposed to buy. So there is this, um, your, your class can determine whether you are a place location in a place that doesn't have great supermarkets, um, doesn't have great transport, um, entertainment, whatever, and your whole quality of life is suppressed as a result. So in a way, what Punartam has done, and I hope I don't imply that it's been done perfectly, um, has said, we're going we're gonna to codify this. We're actually going to make it so, yes, everybody's still going to have a basic level of comfort, but since human beings kind of want their strata of society anyway, we're actually going to formalize it. We're going to formalize it and make sure 
that um, you know the people who really do kind of get the perks of this and people who should be getting the perks of this <laughs> and um, so that was the joy of it the kind of knowing that I was doing this thought experiment and it was basically mirroring some some actual research but then the the the, 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 the trauma of it was I needed to find a way to do match fixing and I had done a cashless society that has the credit so tightly regulated in, in both aspects. And, and I mean, I spent a week, I kid you not, unable to write, walking up and down the house like a ghost. And um, my father was like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I need, I need to have, um, you know, like match fixing. I need to have like, you know, stuff going on underground. And I, I've written this thing so tightly that I can't do it. What, what's going to happen? So that was when I started to look a bit more closely at the accoutrements thing, because the accoutrements are in a way both, um, you know, they both, they both have financial wealth in the sense that it can be a gem or something like that, but they have social wealth because people look at it and be like, oh, you're protected by the Hanekis. Oh, you're protected by this house or by this academe or whatever. And then that becomes a little extra something. And, um, and I mean, then there was like the, the full on, um, you know, sort of like underground economy that was using galactic credits. But to have that little intermediate thing, especially for the, for the sports match fixing or whatever, when I finally came out, I was like, oh, huge relief. It was like, yes, I can make this work and it will actually add to the story. So, um, but, but it, 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 took, it took a lot of thinking through and, um, and as I said, you know, people talk about writer's block a lot and where it comes from. And for me, it comes from when something has happened to derail my suspension of disbelief. Um, you have written a structure and then something about the structure is flawed. You're like, okay, wait, 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 the wheel's going to come off. Let's step back and see what's missing. I maybe need to add an extra cog here, whatever, whatever. And then it starts moving and you're like, okay, fine. We can, we can get a thousand words in this week. <laughs> Well, this kind of makes me want to transition a little bit because I think you do something that's always been around in classic sci-fi is like the rule of law is who can transport the goods in the universe. And you have many ways of transporting and we learn of a new old way in the galaxy mm -hmm. game. But it all starts with the power vacuum of Sidira leaving because they have their mind ships, which still exist, but like their control and regulation kind of leaves it for the cartels, which we get a glimpse of how they their machines work in the Blue Beautiful World. But that's, in my head, I know the least about the... Um, is it Zeno? He know, I don't know how to say that. Zeno, yeah. Zeno. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just, I thought it was very interesting that you recognize that there would be multiple ways of travel and that this is actually how resources travel is what causes most strife. And that's what we focus on. And I mean, that's been being done since Dune, right? But Dune only has this one transport, this one thing that does <laughs> it here. It's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's the, the cartels are upset because we discover this new method and the mine ships can actually be separated from new Sidira when they don't like what's happening there. And how did, what, where did all these ideas come from? And, you know, which one was your favorite to think up? So this is all historical. Anytime you look yeah. at uh, history of um, first contact, really, and, um, and all of those exploratory voyages, you know, um, Columbus, Magellan, all the rest of them, really, again, as you say, it's about how can we move goods as quickly and as efficiently as possible with as um you know with as little destruction as possible in terms of either loss of ships or loss of lives um right now we have this really amazing situation where we've romanticized pirates and we've romanticized the era when you go back and read probably about the era it was just not a nice thing to be doing to be going across the ship you know going across the atlantic the pacific or whatever you know rounding these capes and and so forth this was this was really fraught stuff the Panama Canal, there's a reason why so many people had to die to build it because the alternative was just, you know, was not the greatest. Um, so it was very easy to think of different ways. I mean, for us, in terms of the oceans, it basically became um, a question of the seas. And a lot of Caribbean history is very much about various navies trying to um, keep power and control over various territories because although we didn't have a lot of land mass, we had a lot of strategic importance in terms of, okay, here's a good port and what have you. And, um, and then when you speak of continents as well, where, you know, it's still a question of moving goods from one side of the continent to the other, 
Um, we're still looking at things like, you know, Silk Road, for example, or caravans and who controls that and the way stations and everything of that sort. So immediately, if you're going to have any kind of galactic government, it has to be what are the exchanges? What are what are the connections? And and most of all, everybody's fixated on, you know, faster than light travel. And I'm all I'm thinking when I'm thinking faster than light travel is what's the bulk that I can move? Because even before you get to how fast am I going? I want to know how much can I take with me? A lot of SF that deals with galactic or, you know, universe spanning stories. I kind of gloss over that. And what they're really doing is doing an age of sale thing, transported wholesale into the future without really looking at how they would be different. So I didn't want to quite do that. I wanted to say, okay, you know, we're we're not age of sale. We don't have a boat with a huge hold that we can just like dump barrels of stuff into or whatever. That's not happening. We do need to think of it as what are the changes, what are the restrictions, um, and also what are the dangers? Because again, in first contact, we did have spread of disease in places that had never been before, and with with catastrophic effects on existing populations, and. That was where I was able to hint to the first galactic war um, that this was a thing that got weaponized. That, and that's why the transports had to be shut down. So all of that really was just me completely looking at the past and saying, here's, here's what happened in real life. How do we tweak that in terms of what could happen in the future and what could happen off, off of this planet? No, I, I really like the emphasis on that. And I guess, I think, so although the cartels in multiple instances, they are probably the thing I know the least about, but also the thing that are easiest for me to be upset with. They tend to do relatively bad things fairly often, but I think the thing that was most unsettling to me in this um, universe was what happens with the Sadira culture, especially to the women of that culture, after we have that loss of the planet. And I guess mm. you do mention in your author's note at the end of The Best of All Possible Worlds that this is directly inspired by something that happened, but I guess... I still have questions about one of my favorite characters of the best of all possible worlds. And I just want to know if she's okay. <laughs> I just, and I guess we she's do okay. Kind of... She's okay. okay. And if there's going to be a fourth book, it will be about her being okay. I'm very excited about that. That's like the best news I've had all day. Cause I, I love her so much. Um, but, but I, I don't know. I should have said it because it's like, not like it's coming next year or the year after. No, it's no. Like, this is all a nebulous idea. And you know, you know, the slow pace at which this sort of stuff happens. Well, and what is great about these books is because not only do we have to trust you as readers, you are also trusting us to do some work. Like, it's not like you are going to stumble into understanding this world 100% on like a first read unless like you're really trying to keep track of some connections. At least that was my experience. And like rereading the Galaxy game was so rewarding mm -hmm. <laughs> because I like I remembered like I don't know if I remembered all the Excellent. details, but I remembered when I would fill in some blanks and I guess this was a question I did put on those is like, you know, you read the best of all possible worlds and it's such an intimate story in so many ways. And both the galaxy game and the blue beautiful world are, the scope is broader. We're, we're zoomed out a bit more. We do have moments of intimacy that we zoom in with characters, but our first person perspective isn't even who you would expect in the galaxy game. You know, that's not Raffi. Raffi is still third person. We're kind of, Raffi learns a lot off page that we don't get to learn with him, which is I think a very unique choice. <laughs> Um, so I think <laughs> knowing that though made it a little bit easier for me because there's a lot of like it's rewarding but there is a lot you know there's a barrier of like this is not how I'm used to stories being told like you talked about at the beginning of this it's like I need to just let it happen and actually I don't know if you know of this booktuber and Jiri from the channel Onyx pages she is who recommended me your books because she was reading The Unraveling and she's like you because mm -hmm. I had liked a different book um, this is how do you lose the time war and she's like well if you like that and you're good with a book just washing over you and you just have to take it as it comes. <laughs> you need to try out Karen Lord. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, here I go. And I think I read Redemption mm -hmm. Indigo during the, the middle of the pandemic and it was such a source mm -hmm. of, of joy to me. Um, so I'm getting off on tangents now, but I do want to ask, you know, what made you choose in this universe? Because you're right, it's not a traditional trilogy. Although I would hesitate to tell someone you can jump in at any book because I do think the world building works best if you start from the beginning. Not that you can't meet mm -hmm. Raffi in the galaxy game and be fine getting to know him or anything like that. But what made you decide to go from a very intimate, you know, character study, team building exercise to this broader scope where we still are watching an arc. Like you said, Raffi gets an arc. 
we definitely see him grow and everything, but what led behind that, mm -hmm. those decisions? So, um, <clears throat> I love your assumption that it was a very conscious and considered decision. So let's, let's, let's roll with that, shall we? As opposed to my just working things out as a cool one. So let's, assuming it was a considered decision, what I do find anytime um, you're a reader and you're reading not for not for a university, you're not reading to like do a review, you're not reading um, a close reading where it's like there's somebody with a red pen ready to, to mark you for forgetting a particular scene or not noticing a particular bit of character development, but you're just reading for you. It's very easy for you to mentally skim the bits that you're not interested in. So when I see people read the best of all possible worlds, and I know that that's actually um, one of the, the sort of, for now, like the most popular of the three books, um, a lot of people do focus on the intimacy, not even just of the team, but between Tlanaf and, and Alarua. And they're like, oh, this is a romance. And I kind of step back a little bit and I'm like, as fond as I am of my characters, <laughs> the romantic bits between those two probably are less than 20% of the book. And you have to be doing some high grade level skimming to see it as primarily a romance. You have to be very emotionally invested. And I'm not saying you're wrong because that's my comfort read too. I too go back and just like, you know, delve into their old scenes because they give me a lot of joy. But they are a very small part of the book and the book already has a lot of not just world building, but as you know, it's about galaxy building going on. That if you've been skimming all that because you want to see what's going to happen next between Tarach and Jalarua, then galaxy game is going to hit you in the face and you're going to be like, where did this come from? I'm like, yeah, I see that back in the best possible world. We're just not paying attention. <laughs> so, um, so in a way, it's hard because what a, a series should do, what a trilogy should do, and this is what I'm not doing, <laughs> is it should kind of give the readers an expectation of this is the kind of read I will have. This is the kind of read I will have. If I pick up this book by um, Jeff Vandermeer, China Nieville, or Kelly Link, or whoever, this is how they do things, and I can be comfortable in that. Whenever I'm writing, I always feel as if I'm primarily serving the story. So the best of all possible worlds is told the way it's told, not only because I was starting off with writing exercises, so that's how I evolved, but also because that's the kind of story that is best looked at through that type of lens or filter, where um, Glenach and Delarua are their own individuals, but they're also emblematic or representative of their cultures. So you can talk about a little bit of culture, clash or culture, whatever, using these two as your avatars. So that worked. The galaxy game, I had to step back and think long and hard. I was like, I need to tell the story about galactic politics. One person can't be everywhere. Not even two people can be everywhere. It's, I am not going to write some kind of hereditary monarchical, one single prince who manages to like be hugely important for everything because I, my suspension of belief can't tolerate that. So what you see happening in the galaxy game is there are six voices. There are three voices of the younger generation and three voices of the older generation. The three voices of the older generation are Delarua, Planach, and Silian. They're the ones whose heads you get into at various points of the story. And the older one, the younger ones, of course, are Serendipity, Rafi, and Antenna. And they see different parts of things that are happening and have different interests and focuses or whatever. And through that, I, I hope that the reader can piece together what's happening to the galaxy as a whole. But you, in your heart and in your desire to emotionally connect, have at that point to step back and no longer be interested in one person or two people, but instead be interested in, oh my goodness, what's going to happen with the Sidiri? Oh my goodness, what's going to happen with the Sidians? If you don't start having that more um, kind of broad concern <laughs> for, for peoples, uh, people and peoples instead of persons, uh, a handful of persons, you're not going to find it easy to connect with. Now, this is my bias because coming through sociology, coming through religious studies and whatever, I am fascinated by people and peoples. I am fascinated by how communities survive and I can feel as, as deep a concern or love for a community getting along and doing well and thriving as I can for an individual. I want the community to have a happy ever after. But if you um, are just looking for a more individual story, 
than the Galaxy game, there's almost nothing for you to hold on to. I accept that. And then by the time you get to the Blue Beautiful World, oh my goodness. We talked for a while and I need to quiz you now. I need to find out from you. So how does the Blue Beautiful World strike you in terms of what format is chosen? Because I've done something different again. So it, rem it was more similar to the Galaxy game for me than the Best of All Possible Worlds, but it was, it was interesting because it, it almost felt like, and I don't, act, I don't know what the final copy looks like, but it almost felt like there were distinct parts. It's like, oh, I'm with these people for a few chapters, and now I'm with these people for a few chapters. And so, and I mean, that's a little more something I can be used to in other sci-fi and fantasy that wasn't like incredibly like a, a narrative framing that I wasn't used to. But what I did notice is the best of all possible worlds in the Galaxy game do have fairly unique narrative framings, or at least... I don't know, I almost imagine the Galaxy game, we're looking at these old diary entries that Raffi has that this person's kind of watching. Yes, like yes, that's yes, how I yes, see exactly. that narrative framework. And then obviously the best of possible worlds is Della Rua's like biography or something yes. like that. And I- You're right. <laughs> and, I, and this one felt almost more straightforward in terms mm -hmm. of just like, all right, I'm just with a new perspective. We're a new part of the problem that we're trying to solve. And these are the people mm -hmm. we need to see to solve this part of the problem. And it usually happened between time jumps, if I'm remembering correctly. So mm -hmm. that's that was my interpretation. I'm glad I was right about the Galaxy game, though, because on each read, I'm like, I think this is what's happening. This is why this is the prologue and this is the epilogue and what this, you know, this kid's doing. <laughs> exactly so, because the framing for the best of possible worlds is we're looking at um, Delarue's memoirs, basically. You know, yeah. you see that at the end. The Galaxy game, the same thing. This is basically um, Rafi as as patron showing um, Kiratsi, her um, Narua at that time. Yeah, the different names are going to bug people, but I'm sorry, it had to work. <laughs> um, showing Narua um, the family history, the family history, the family background. This is how we came to the point that we are. This is why I'm doing things the way I'm doing them. And um, and yes, every every um, when when he goes through the the different data charms and audio plugs or whatever, those are literally the voices that you come across in the Galaxy game because that's that's the information, that's where the information is being pulled from. When you get into the Blue Beautiful World, um, I mean, the the um, that was not on a hold up. That was not on a hold up because, again, you had a situation where, okay, we're not looking at a full galaxy this time, but we're just looking at Earth, but still, there are a lot of moving parts happening in different places. And we can still say that there is a connection between these people. So in some respects, what is happening can still end up being in a kind of a collective um, record of some sort, especially using VR. But at that point, I was like, I don't need to hold on too tightly the whole concept of a memoir or an oral um, legend, um, family legend or whatever. That was fine for the best all possible in the Galaxy game. This one is going to have to look a little different. So as you said, there are three parts. Each part has a different flavor to it, um, but the first and the second are more distinct. The third is more of a combining of the first two in the sense that um, the stuff that was happening in the beginning and the stuff that's happening in the middle, it's like um, both kind of coming to some sort of like connection and, and um, resolution, shall we say, all the stuff that's been building and being built. This is this is where we're actually getting, getting somewhere. And um, what I wanted to do with that really was <laughs> sorry i'm laughing someone else i spoke to was like yeah i read the first part and i thought i knew where this was going and i was wrong <laughs> I was like, i'm so sorry because the first part sounds like um you know it, it feels it feels almost like a again a very personalized almost like spy type romp um you know where noriko is who we're going to focus on or whatever and i and i give noriko full play um you know side digress side um digressions and with Rafi and whatever. But then I almost like dropped Noriko until the third bit. Yep. And um, some people are not gonna be happy about that. So sorry. But there are other people in there that I really do need to focus on. Kanoa is actually hugely important. Kanoa is hugely important and Kanoa is one of the first characters that showed up in my mind for the beautiful world. And um, that whole connection to the oceans and his the importance of his father and his father's death. Um, to me really is very central to the book, very much at the heart of the book, because it also then mirrors some of the choices that Rafi makes. And if anything, one of the reasons why the Blue Beautiful World 
can be such a, a spanning story where some people come in and are the forefront protagonists or heroes and then step back and let someone else come in is because by the time you get to the end, you almost feel like Rafi has reached that place as well, where um, he's almost like more part of a collective than he is an individual. And that actually gives him the freedom to travel and the freedom to express his power in a way that is not uncontrolled. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're almost talking about the meta aspects of the, of the craft here. And I feel that I've written this book so recently and it's so fresh that I'm not going to have a, a proper idea as to what I intended until at least another three years forward. That's the truth. I may think this is what I meant, but it's going to become clearer as I get more distance. Um, so I hope you'll give me a little, allow me to beg off going deeper into that. Right now, the best thing I can do is say to you, as a reader, how did it strike you? As a reader, how how did you, you know, find this? Especially when you said you were reading some of the stuff, I guess, that Canola was learning in school and was like, oh, I didn't get this before in the previous two books. Well, I think it, specifically how genetically different everyone was, was never very clear to me until that moment, right? Like with mm -hmm. Sigma Beta, you get a sense that there is genetic crossover, but mm -hmm. I didn't know quite you know, who could marry who and have children successfully, like that whole line of thought mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, the, you go to the Blue Beautiful World and I, in my back of my copy, it does have like all the names and what means what, because like, it's like, I have learned all of these names for these planets and now I have to learn these new names for these silly earth people who don't know <laughs> the names that I know. <laughs> yeah, so when you, you said briefly at the beginning that in the galaxy game you realized, oh, I have more thoughts, it's gonna, probably be pushed the blue beautiful world were one of those thoughts that you did want to return to earth and explore a first contact story or did that come from other ideas it was very much a case of what happens when the earth embargo is lifted i knew the cartels were meddling in earth um, for a while in fact um especially by the time i hit about 2016 and you know global politics like went silly season mm -hmm. i was like you know, I, I would love to believe in aliens at this point, meddling, as opposed to think that we're really this daft. <laughs> so it was almost like a little wish fulfillment there at that point. That's how I felt um, when I read that part. It's like, oh, if only we could just blame these aliens for our nonsense, that would be wonderful. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, there are aspects where I'm writing and it's like, you know, I got to think of my suspension of disbelief. There are other bits where it's like, I don't believe this, but right now I need that little cozy kind of, just imagine if I could just see this. Yeah, yeah so that, that was what was happening there. Um, I would say as well that the aspects of um, Rafi's arc still has to conclude in how he is not going to become like his father. So although you saw a taste of that in the Galaxy game where he's like, oh, you know, I am actually working at something that's positive and my talent is appreciated and no one is afraid of me. You do already get that sense there that, you know, it's good. And especially him coming under the, the Haneki protection. I think that was also very huge because um, his, his foster sister and, and, um, and the Patrona definitely saw his potential and definitely saw that he was someone to be nurtured. Yeah. and kind of kept in their fold. Again, I hope I don't make it seem as if they're like hugely benevolent. <laughs> they're very, they're I don't think much... they come across as hugely benevolent in the book. I think they're really, mm -hmm. they're not malevolent either. They're just, mm -hmm. I think something you accomplished, which I assume was a goal is, yes, we have these four alien species that are all, you know, connected, but none of them feel alien to me. They just feel... Mm -hmm like different cultures and people. And yes, sometimes there are very unique abilities like the mind reading telepathy or the effect on emotions. Like there are things that are fantastical sci-fi about these different alien species. But I, I truly felt like I wasn't feeling the otherness that you typically feel when you're reading about aliens and things like mm -hmm. that, I guess. So I thought that was really well done. And I, I've been very fixated on quality cultural world building this year. And it's very obvious when I don't see it well now, having read so many authors who I know are really <laughs> focusing on the society. It's like, well, now I have these examples of like, when you were actually not focusing on just the aesthetic of culture, which obvious is here. Like you travel to Panartum and you were talking about the accoutrements. Like there is an aesthetic that is different mm -hmm. here from Cygnus Beta, but that's not the first thing I would think about when I think about that culture. <laughs> like I'm thinking about all these other things. So I don't know. I just, I truly enjoy what? exploring this universe <laughs> that you've created. 
what you said just now about the feeling of otherness is is fascinating and i don't know if i'll be able to like fully address it in the time but it does strike me that for too many writers and too many readers um alien cultures are a stand-in for contemporary foreign cultures and um and sometimes sometimes they do that directly sometimes there's literally a oh here is a particular um, plant that seems to be based on you know kind of Middle Eastern culture. Here is an alien plant that seems to be based on, on um, you know, Chinese history, whatever. And it feels a bit lazy to me. It feels it feels excessively lazy to me because um, if we are still and, and maybe the best of all possible worlds is sorry the blue beautiful world says as well. If we're so obsessed with otherness within our own planet, we can't even properly visualize what true difference might mean. And um, I wanted to create, that's why, that's why everyone in this galaxy is human, because I was like, I'm not just going to stick pointy ears on these people and say that they're completely alien. I am going to make them all baseline human, although with like, you know, branch off differences. My, my notes way in the back that I don't share with everyone is basically like, you know, in, on Earth, we basically have um, the... Neanderthals and Denisovans are the human groups that they've discovered have contributed genetic material even up into modern humans, right? So my idea is that um, at least Adir and, and Shune are probably like completely more that stream than they are um, the um, Homo sapiens, cro magnon whatever strain that is predominantly what we have right now. And that's just to make it clear, just as on our planet we had different species levels that could still interbreed within our planet that's what we're seeing in the galaxy there and and it's important simply because when i do talk about difference like what's going on in the oceans like the pilot um mind ship relationship you know what that difference is and we're still not talking about otherness because there's still a connection yeah. there's still a connection there's still communication there's still there's still um you know collaboration of sorts so so yeah. All right. I think I have two. Oh, more questions I did warn I you. I was gonna segue like mad. No, this is. No problem. Mm -hmm. I'm having a great time. So I want to do make sure we get these last two questions because they're things I want while I have you with me. I don't really care if we go over time. If you do, <laughs> don't. So, <laughs> but I don't my, care. I don't care. Yeah. But um, one thing, especially, I think this makes more sense to me now that you've talked about your um, background with religious studies. But when did you decide to have this unifying myth and almost this? There's this, I, I mean, my interpretation at this point is there's this far off future where humanity has changed so much. It becomes maybe a mythical legend that can create this. Oh, sorry that my cat just entered and loudly announced himself. <laughs> but nice. you know, <laughs> this is my life all the time. But where did the origins of those myths come from? And how, you, this is it's the it's actually one of those universal threads. Neraldi and his friend are kind of around all three books. And where did that come from? And why was it important for you to always, you know, if all the information you give us, why is this a thing that's always the thread? Like that origin story comes up in almost every book to some level or another. And I, I really like it because I'm a sucker for origin tales, but I'd love to hear where it came from. So the whole, um, you know, planetary seeding thing is an, an old thing. I think, I think you, you even see it in Star Trek because Star Trek has to explain why everybody's basically humanoid <laughs> um, not everybody but like most people and um, so you know we're, we're playing with a very old trope and the other kind of associated trope with that is that there have to be things that are so far back in history that there is not a clear record of them there's just like stuff that's been passed on word of mouth and it basically turns into a story or a legend or something like that which um, no one can really pick apart um, not just what the truth of the thing is, but but what the accuracy of the thing is, because you know, you're you're basically trying to describe to a contemporary audience something that um, you know doesn't exist anymore, and and they just may not even have the educational framework to really understand it. Um, the example I would give is um, go back five hundred years and try to explain DNA to you know to someone that, you know, even at a university, <laughs> a European university somebody, explain DNA to them and it's gonna sound like madness. It's gonna sound just like you're, you're you know, halfway talking about magical stuff. So, so that, that was kind of, um, of where I was going with that. But it was also because the moment I allowed neurology to exist as someone who 
had gone traveling through time and was looking at all these different options and so on. I basically said to myself, um, he can't really do this as an amateur. He can't. I can't. This is where my suspension disbelief gets wrecked again. He can't do this as an amateur because he's basically going to like make some mistake and just like be dead or, or be like you know, have his consciousness smeared over several centuries or something really stupid. So I said, you know, I feel as if there's somebody who has to like pop in and say, oh, look at this interesting thing that this you know equivalent to like a, a dog or a guinea pig is doing let me have them in my lab and examine them for a bit and see what new things they're learning and where their intelligence is and so on so then you end up with sear now i'm not going to talk too much about them because they are a bit of as you say a side story or a side thread but it does give you that other sense of not the ocean intelligence is now, but some other intelligence is now who, if, if anything, the medium is swimming more into that and, and more, and how they might view humanity as well. So rather than just saying we've got, you know, separate human species, intelligences, um, you know, encounter, or even separate um, um, entities within a planet encounter, we're, we're actually playing with the idea of separate intelligences in different dimensions. But it's not the focus of the story. We still do make it a side thing. Um, and it's, it's really just a whole case of there are all these different factors in there. And at least you can say these know how to observe and not interfere too much. <laughs> and, um, and that helps you to streamline the story, to not make it have too many moving parts, but still just hint at a little bit of a little complexity and a little, a little additional stuff at the side. Um, the extra stories in um, Galaxy Game in the best possible world, but primarily in the Galaxy Game, which are both about Sarah and Morality. Um, how did those strike you? I mean, I liked all of them because, I mean, I think I am very much, I love like the characters and one of my favorite characters has one of the stories in the best of all possible world. So I like that one and I like Rafi's story, but I did love what, getting to know Neraldi better and the struggles he had on his trials, even though he was like, he knew he should be listening to this guy and he shouldn't have put his roots down and like his own internal issues. I did like that story. Um, and I think, what was the other one? Like a poem that was referenced in that previous story. It's been a couple months since I read these short stories. <laughs> so, but I, I did like them and they did expand on the side tangent. And I, I, I enjoy, I mean, I just enjoy, I think mm -hmm. Neraldi is the perfect character to have those types of side tangents with because he's such a character, but he's never the center of anything. And he doesn't want to be, he's just an observer. He'll maybe put a hand in to help here or there, but he's not our protagonist. He's not even a side character. Mm -hmm. He is... He's always around mm -hmm. and you think he should be more useful because he mm -hmm. has all the experiences. Like, nope, I'm not, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to, unless I really need yeah, to. Yeah. I, I enjoy that <laughs> about him. I don't know. I just, he's one of the, I you know, there's some characters you can picture in movies and I'm like, oh, I can see you right? <laughs> not being helpful, but I would enjoy you every time <laughs> you're on screen. <laughs> so the, the funny thing is, I suspect the reason why you see Neuralgia as much as he does is that um, by the time I was uh, near the end of the or whatever, I realized that there already had fans. And I was I was surprised because he, he's not like visually, he's not your perfect protagonist. He's not your perfect but like, romantic focus of romance. Um, you know, he's someone who basically is like relatively middle aged and then goes through all this experience of ages hugely, then sort of bounces back and then ages again. And so you know, I have in this in my mind a sort of a a green experienced person who is slightly aloof because he still has so many experiences and he feels a little separate from the ordinary human right now. And um, and he's and Sarah has already trained him. I mean, we discussed this. That, that was actually part of the story with him and Sarah, where Sarah is like, I'm trying to teach you to be interested in the dynasty and not in the individual. I'm trying to teach you to be in love with the, with the dynasty and the collective and not with the one person who can stay a stranger for as long as you live with them. And um, so so but for some reason people who've read him have been like oh yeah and around me he's so hot i'm like hey? <laughs> and, and i'm like you do you that's cool but but i'm just tickled because you know i can see the things i like about Naraldi, but i never thought of them as creating a character that was particularly like sexy or fascinating in any way but it was Maybe like i love he's the, he's the fighter pilot him, so. trope. i think that's it i think it's we put in the fighter pilot trope he is 
maybe not Han Solo, but you know, he's, <laughs> he's, I don't know. He, he's he, a lot wiser than Han Solo. <laughs> but, you, but you know what I mean? Like he's, I mean, I don't even yes. like Han Solo. I'm trying to think of the one in the newer trilogy. I'm not a big Star Wars person, but like <laughs> something Poe. It's like, you know, they're always these, you know, loners yes. who like are on it for adventure. And like, I think maybe we are putting a lot of what we expect into the trope in between the lines, even if you didn't put them there is what I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. So it could, that, that's, that is that's a very guess. good point. I can see that. I can see that. Because yeah. you don't tell us that he's not charming and charismatic. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my last question, and you already said that one day down the line, no pressure on when we are maybe getting another book mm -hmm. in this universe. And what are you willing to tell us about that? Me specifically. I don't I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to share with you my initial images of, of what would be in this book. So the book would more focus on what's happening in Aim. The okay. book would be about what happened to Nasia for all the, the decades that she's been missing, or at least that they have not known where she was. But um, I hope that you recall in the Galaxy game, there is this bit that I, it's a scene I like very much, and it's Zira. Talking to Serendipity and her friend and um, basically drawing their attention to this woman pilot who got so badly injured that basically her ship is trying to heal her. And, um, and then I make reference to that at the end of the Galaxy game where um, yeah, I think it's um, Sianri who was talking to Nintendo and saying, oh, I hear that there is um, this pilot that's meshed with their ship now. And the idea is that um, because of the healing process, there has been a far greater connection now between this, this human pilot and this Sidiri human pilot and this, this mind ship that would ordinarily be the case. It's almost like a, a physical integration, and you know, oh, that yeah. she cannot actually leave the ship itself. Um, and I've always thought to myself, if I were to write a story about, you know, kind of saving trafficked Sidiri women, that is the ship that would be the vigilante ship doing that kind of stuff. That would be the ship that would have the, the, the weird talents and the things that are unexpected that would allow them to, you know, slip in and out and do stuff. And Nasiha would 100% allow herself to be diverted from um, her, her husband and her children by something that huge that she felt that she could help with. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Whenever it happens. I mean, I still... I don't know if you do this with your, you know, favorite authors. I always like keep one book in reserve. It like, took me a, an absurd amount of time to read Emergency Skin by N.K. Jemisin after I'd read a bunch of other stuff. And <laughs> the book I haven't read from you yet is Unraveling. And I have a few of your short stories, but I do want to get to mm -hmm. Unraveling soon because it's been that sequel for a long time that I've been wanting to get to. But I will be mm -hmm. patient and I will wait for whenever we get the next thing. And I mean, what is so wonderful, like I said, about this universe, because like you said, at the beginning, we're all like geeks that love the nuts and bolts. Like, for me, I will I will always love rereading the books in this world because it's like, although I think I'm pretty good at attention to detail and connecting dots, there are things that I don't connect on the first try. And I'm just like, <laughs> always be connections to make, always little aha moments. And like, I went into the blue beautiful world, not really knowing a lot. I'm like, I know it's in this universe and I know the world building of the universe. And it, the moment we learn who Owen is, I'm like, oh, you know, I didn't realize we were gonna continue with this character, but cool. And I felt bad for him because, you know, he always has that weight on him of not trusting himself because of his dad, which makes sense. But I'm just like, oh, I feel so bad for you because in my head, you really are so well-intentioned and you've always been listening to those around you. Like, those are all qualities of people I appreciate. It's like, you pay attention, you listen, you're willing to learn. Like, if you're willing to do all of those things. I can't see you becoming the tyrant you think you will. But he doesn't have that same, you know, he has that imposter syndrome of like, no, he will lose control. Um, so I, I think mm -hmm. this is the perfect companion for the Galaxy game because I think it strengthens a lot of the character work that is grounded in the Galaxy game that you get that follow through, especially with Raffi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And some of, you know, the young kids that are just babies in the first Galaxy game, you know, get to see them travel a bit. <laughs> yes. you, I said that you were telling me that was the last question, but there was something you said that I wanted to address. You said that um, you love rereading it because the connections you didn't make before, there's always new connections to make, there's always new things to see. And the same way I said that I, I write my books for the people who don't have long vacations, <laughs> can't read door stoppers. I do also read, write books for people who love to reread. 
because I've always loved to do that. I've always loved rereading. I've always loved coming back to things fresh. I've always loved, um, you know, maybe a book that I, I didn't like that much first time around coming back and seeing, oh, you know, with my new experience or new knowledge or whatever, here's what's unfolding now. Um, there are definitely some authors who I didn't pay a lot of attention to when I was younger who have grown to appreciate precisely because I'm now able to detect the layers. So um, I, I, I really do hope that um, that comes through. I don't want you to spend money on my book and then only read it once. I do want you to know that this is a book that is geared for you to read several times. And the other thing I was going to say is, um, you did ask me what was next in terms of the Cygnus beta books, but quickly to say that new reissued um, editions of Redemption and Indigo and Unraveling are coming next year, in next year's summer. So um, I don't think there's going to be any additional material for those, I'm sorry. <laughs> It'll just be like fresh covers and packaging together because the books themselves are 10 years apart in publication. And I think some people would never have noticed that they were part of a series. So we're just going to push the aspect of it being a series. It's a little risky because one is like folklore that you could read to your kid. The other one is like horror that you definitely shouldn't read to your kid. But <laughs> obviously this is the way I roll, making things very, you know, widely different. Um, so that's coming out. And I do have a manuscript in progress, which is neither of those two. That will probably be published before I return to those worlds. And even redemption story i want to do the um the idea i have for the trickster to have a book before i go back to Messiah's story so that's why i was like i feel almost bad telling you this stuff about her because it's like this is not gonna happen for a little while <laughs> i mean i i'm patient either i i it'll be great because i mean what is nice about each of your books even though you are continuing thoughts the way that it seems that your brain likes to think about the next idea is everything is still a capsule of a complete thought so it's not like oh, there's this huge cliffhanger. Like, at least I do know she is safe in the um, the Blue Beautiful world. Because that I, was actually- I hate cliffhangers and I don't do cliffhangers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was saying, if I ever give you a cliffhanger, trust me when I say that the next will be coming over like six months because I don't believe in leaving people like on the edge for a while. Sorry, you were saying um, unraveling is- Well, you were saying unraveling is more of a horror. And I was like, ooh, maybe I should try and get to that this yeah. spooky season because <laughs> it's just staring at me. <laughs> Just always, I mean, never ending stack of books everywhere, but I've been trying, it's been a, a stressful time of year for me. So I've been trying to just go to all the authors that help me like actually escape into books mm. where, you know, it's just effortlessly, I'm just like in a cool place. And similarly, like what I said with Ken Liu, like you are thinking of and asking questions that I like to think about, but I don't like to put in the work of following through on that thought experiment. So I get to see <laughs> your interpretation of the follow through and I'm like, oh, cool. Mm. And I do appreciate it. I personally really appreciate well thought out like world building. Like it doesn't need to be nuts and bolts. Like you don't need to teach me how the television works. It doesn't need to be hard magic. It can be soft and loose. It just has to feel self-consistent and thought out, you know, and you know, like you said, mm -hmm. to not make my, my suspension of disbelief just completely crumble. So, and that definitely, exactly. I didn't even notice that that was part of this. It's like, yeah, I could always trust that you weren't just on the fly introducing a concept that wasn't already either reverse integrated into something to make sure it made sense with what you had or was thought of early on. Like I never had a stumbling block of wait, but why, why is this here now? <laughs> like, this is surprising, <laughs> but thank you so much for being my center second interview on this series. Thank you. This is so great. I'm so excited for all your works. I'm excited that in the U S we will be getting new covers because I keep buying UK covers. Well, the old version. <laughs> I just think they're, well, I'm not normally that person. I'm not normally the UK covers better than the US, but unfortunately for your books, I just feel like they've chosen some very odd choices. Like the American cover of Redemption and in Indigo looks so serious. And I'm like, that book is so funny. <laughs> like, I don't know how to explain that it's so satirical and it's, it's so, so witty. <laughs> I, had, I had a lot of input into that cover, um, but I have to say that it took me a long time for me to absorb the fact that apparently I do write humor. I'm not aware that I'm writing humor, <laughs> but I do. When so you write in first was... person, your characters are really funny. <laughs> yeah. So that that's probably just I like that's why I say sometimes you need to be stepping back from a book years later before you really get a grasp of what you were doing and how you presented it. Yeah, it's fair. Yeah. 
And I'm always really happy that you get Robin Miles as a narrator because she's one of the best, in my opinion. Like, <laughs> she's one of the best because I reread Redemption and in Indigo via audio and it was phenomenal. All right, mm -hmm. so I'm going to end this here. Thanks for everyone who has watched up to this point. You. Um, you definitely did check out all of her books. I'll have the Ken Liu, Karen Lord podcast, um, it's not a podcast, but the conversation they had down below and in Jerry's page, because I mentioned that. And I may or may not have my series, Should You Read for this book up or before or after this interview, but anything important will be in the description. And I will see you guys in the next one. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.